this delightful book, which many of you have read, but if you haven't, I strongly recommend it, The Black Box Society. Although the fun thing that I've asked him to do um, is to actually talk less about the book and more about some of the other te connected thoughts that he's having. So we're going to get sort of a nice little flavor of different things. Well, thank you so much, Dana. It's so great to be here. I mean, I was just reading materials by uh, Kathy and Alana recently, and I mean, lots of other folks here. I've been, you know, following your work, and um, it's just absolutely fantastic to be here. So, I look forward to hearing your perspectives on some of the stuff that we're struggling with as I'm as an attorney who sort of is in a university setting and teaching and writing about um, the use of big data in research. And also just as someone who is concerned about the future of the healthcare system. And I'm so happy to see some entrepreneurs and folks who work in the uh, healthcare institutions in the area here because I think they have really vital insights uh, on the feasibility of any sort of big scale um, plans to change things. Um, and it can also really help nudge us forward toward um, solutions in this space. So here's the set of problems I want to discuss today. And the key problems that I want to sort of contrast are, and if we want to put this in the most you know, uh, um, broadest terms possible, it's a tension between personal privacy, health privacy, and research imperatives, right? And we see this even in the Supreme Court sometimes with like privacy versus the First Amendment. Um, there are people that want to use drones to say, get a bird's eye view of the entire city and get say a bird's eye view into people's windows. Um, there are others who say, wow, that use of drones is really worrisome. Uh, that violates my personal privacy. And then it comes to the courts and you often have the First Amendment vindicating the right of the drone user to do that. The question that comes up nowadays is, if we have something that is essentially the equivalent to that sort of eye in the sky baked into the infrastructure of healthcare data collection, how do we balance that revolutionary increase in our ability to record health information and health data against, say, the privacy rights, uh, privacy interests of lots of people in the system? So, and, and the other thing that I'm going to sort of contrast today um, as I as discuss that issue and sort of drill down on it in the context of particularly sensitive health information, information about, say, substance abuse, uh, mental health information, information about minors and others, is the necessary tension between giving people granular control over their data and potentially overwhelming them with choice. And I was just actually finishing a great book by a Slovenian social theorist, uh, Renata Salafel, called uh, The Tyranny of Choice. Wonderfully written book. And it talks about how you know all of our efforts as either attorneys, as software designers, as people running systems to give people choices, sometimes can overwhelm them with choice such that they just throw up their hands. So as we go through some of the case studies that I'll discuss today, I hope we can balance those two things. The idea of giving people the right to control their data, to know where it's going, et cetera, but without overwhelming them. To frame those two tensions, I'm going to just introduce some of the stuff that's been happening with the diffusion of electronic health records through the meaningful use subsidies that were part of the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act of 2009. One title of that act was the Health Information, for Te health Information Technology for Economic and Clinical Health Act, um, high tech. Um, and then I'm going to talk about state health information exchange, another really big uh, push here to get draw more and more health data from more and more entities into state health information exchange. The ongoing pressure that that's generating for observational research to complement traditional clinical trials, and the push for quality improvement within healthcare system based on all of these initiatives. And then I'm going to just give a, you know a, a bird a, a sketch overview of some of the privacy rules involved in coming out of both HIPAA and high tech. Um, the role of consent and the unexpected role sometimes of state laws in these areas, because sometimes people think, oh, well, HIP is the privacy law, and then they learn about high tech updating it, and they think, well, that's it. But then there's also all these state privacy laws that could play a role. And finally, how this solution of segmented control over health records has started to emerge, but it's just starting to emerge. And I think it's really going to be a decades-long project to implement something approaching granular control by the patient over their data that nevertheless enables and supports quality observational research that can lead to what the IOM calls a learning healthcare system. Okay, so just to start with an introduction, the Federal Health Privacy Rule was published in its final form in 2002, and it has national standards for protection, use, and disclosure of protected health information. One really key thing to know, though, about the Federal Health Privacy Rule arising out of HIPAA 
is that it only applies to the entities covered under HIPAA and their business associates. So there's this whole universe of other health information that's gathered by other sources, totally untouched by HIPAA and its update in high tech. And that's just something I want us to, to put out there for everyone because every time that you know, folks may want to regulate the space, what we always have to remember is that sometimes when we regulate the space, we can create incentives for those outside of the regulated space to get lots of information. And that's uh, an emerging uh, dilemma in this area. The key goal is to assure individuals' health information is protected while allowing a flow of information to provide quality health care. Okay, and that's why for many of the consent requirements within HIPAA, there are exceptions for purposes of treatment, payment, and operations. And as we go further into the talk, we're going to discuss how, via regulatory arbitrage, exceptions for things like treatment, payment, and operations could become, in some contexts, um, exceptions that swallow the rule for, uh, for some folks. Now, just to get on the table ideas about consent, opt-in consent, the rule there is data cannot be used unless the person affirmatively consents. Opt out, we're going to assume that people can, that we can use the data um, uh, unless they affirmatively object. And then there are all sorts of ways in healthcare research where we can have non-consensual ac non access that can fit within certain regulatory requirements, for example, with the permission of an IRB or other institutional ways of the data, or this can apply to, say, de-identified data, if it's sufficiently de-identified, okay? Now, high tech, the key thing to know about high tech um, was that it essentially was updating HIPAA with respect to the privacy rules. And the reason we needed this, we can go back to HIPAA itself. And HIPAA was essentially a law that was meant in many ways to accelerate the exchange of information for health insurers, okay? But then they had an add-on that said, if we're going to accelerate exchange of health information for insurers and among providers, we've got to have some privacy rules governing it. High tech was a law that was primarily designed to encourage the adoption of health records via subsidies, but then as sort of a bargain there, privacy activists said, if you're going to really adopt, have mass adoption of electronic health records, you've got to build privacy into that. Okay. And you can see why that's important, because if you look at the stages of meaningful use of electronic health records, and the way I explain meaningful use is essentially the government doesn't want to subsidize just every doctor's office like downloading um, a word processing software and then saying, oh, now we've got a health record, right? They, they want to sort of subsidize health record systems that are sufficiently complex and that sort of nudge people towards getting all sorts of data data that can be, and the first stage is to show that they can capture and share critical data. The second stage is to show that they have more decision support using, used. And the third stage is that they're supposed to be able to show improved outcomes from the data they collect. One other thing to note about these stages of meaningful use is they are influenced by lots of federal advisory committees that are sort of advising HHS and others as to the nature of the technology that should be adopted for health data collection. And Sometimes these advisory groups have somewhat controversial recommendations. For example, the Institute of Medicine stated that they felt it was really important that lots of data related to the social determinants of health um, be included. You know, so sometimes this can be rather sensitive data about people's living situations. It can be sensitive data about their sexual history, um, about smoking history, about drug use, about lots of other aspects of, say, someone's life that you could see first on the research side could be quite helpful in tailoring a very good care plan for them, but on the privacy side could be quite devastating if they escape from their native context and go and are learned about by the person's family, by employers, by banks, by others. One other thing to add, and this is just to plug a conference that I'm, I'm helping organize in June called For Patient Privacy Rights, we've got a panel on wellness programs in the workplace. And what's amazing now is, that, you know, as part of the Affordable Care Act, they're pushing wellness programs. And these wellness programs are essentially a way uh, where employers are trying to monitor folks' health, their employees' health, and push them towards healthier lifestyles. But there is so much concern among folks in this, who do work in this policy space that uh, employers aren't going to fire people just on the basis of their being sick, because there's laws against doing that. But they could pretextually fire people based on knowledge that they gather from these programs. That's the worry that a lot of people have. And so I think that that's an increasing worry that we're, that, that's why I think some of the privacy issues here are particularly urgent about being able to segment and control where your data is going. Now, one thing just to note, you know, just to, so we get on the table, what's in all these health records that are being adopted via meaningful use? Health information about past conditions, medications, current systems, demographies, et cetera, results management. Um, 
There's order entry, there's decision support sometime with reminders about possible diagnosis and possible treatments. Um, there's lots of connectivity. And you can imagine that essentially out of this, there are some concerns, right, among patients and doctors. And I, I just wanted to, you know, as a break, I know this is like a lot of law and a lot of, you know, tech, tech material. I just wanted to put it as a, as a break to sort of dramatize some of these, a somewhat funny example from the Seinfeld show of, uh, this is called Difficult Patient. And this shows Eileen's experience with sort of not being able to fully represent what's going on in her health life with respect to her um, uh, doctor. So here it is. Difficult. You're reading that. Tell me about this uh, rash. that someone wrote in my chart that I was difficult in January of 92. And I have to tell you, I remember that appointment exactly. You see, this nurse had asked me to put a gown on, but it was a mole on my shoulder. And actually, I had specifically worn a tank top so that I wouldn't have to put a gown on. You know, then made a paper. Well, that was a long time ago. How about if I just uh, erase it? <laughs> now, about that rash. But it was in pen. Fake <laughs> 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 <Hey>, race. <laughs> All right, this, this doesn't look too serious. It should be fine. Okay. So this was the first. <laughs> And, and it just goes on and on as she tries to sort of repair her reputation as this file just, you know, gets, it's like runaway data. It goes to doctor after doctor after doctor. Um, this was, I think, the first Seinfeld episode inspired by the yellow wallpaper by Charlotte Perkins Gilman, you know. It's like, <laughs> you know but I think it was a very, um, it's a very interesting sort of take on the problem. And I think it really helps us see that, you know, it's not just something that people are, uh, that someone, it helps us understand how people are, in these situations, and they often feel like they don't have control. Um, so to move on from here, I wanted to talk about you know, a wider array of controversial functionalities, right? So one that we just saw in this clip was, what if there are doctors who are writing down in patients' files, difficult patient? Or even more chillingly, you know, drug-seeking behavior, report to prescription drug management plan or report to law enforcement or other things like this. There are all sorts of ways in which, say, on the doctor's side, they can segment out comments or uh, uh, things about the patient, which raises also, you know, the physician's own privacy rights, right? Which, again, a big tangle. But I, I also want to talk about here, um, what about, uh, should the, the co more controversial functionalities include things like um, uh, including patient, suspicions about patients' overuse of drugs um, or the use of medical records to see if uh, doctors themselves may be overprescribing drugs, um, all the social determinants of health issues that I just mentioned, um, feeding them into things like Google flu trends. Obviously, they'd probably they'd be de-identified before that, but there are others who raise, raise concerns about, say, the reliability there. Um, if they were to use it something, in something like a Google Flow Trends scenario, I know that Google Flow Trends itself is not based on this sort of health data. Um, and with PHRs, um, there is increasingly pressure for personal health records to be integrated into electronic health records or vice versa, for electronic health records to come into people's personal health records. So the question becomes, you know, at what point do all of these functionalities lead to types of records that really are not properly under the control of the person who they, the records are about, the data subject? Now. On top of all that, I just wanted to make sure that we had on the table the changes that are happening in the nature of healthcare research. So I just was describing the privacy side. But on the research side, essentially, there's this push for something called the learning healthcare system, which is essentially a way of devising the delivery of healthcare such that each clinical intervention becomes data for future research about the efficacy of that clinical intervention. Right? In traditional terms, we may think about, say, there's a randomized controlled trial where we test out a drug, and then out of this universe of science, randomized clinical trials, we draw the best information, and then we treat people on the basis of the best information. The idea behind a learning healthcare system is that every single intervention is going to be something that is actually going to lead to more knowledge about the system. That has been done via things like quality improvement, but now there's pressure to not only do that as a quality improvement activity, but to do it as a broader activity 
among private healthcare providers with help from academic researchers. So it raises really difficult questions you know, about how you deal with that. The hierarchy of medical evidence just to situate these types of observational research is that usually we think of the randomized controlled clinical trials as the gold standard going all the way down to observational methodologies, going down to uncontrolled experiments, going down to individual case reports. But given the work also of people like Ben Goldacre and the critics of clinical trials and the critics of the fact that a lot of clinical trials are not really released, we're seeing more and more pressure on observational methodologies as really critical sources of medical information. For example, if you think about the way in which the Vioxx drug, the problems with Vioxx were discovered, those really weren't discovered in like randomized clinical trials. Those were discovered in over larger observation of, of data. And so what I'm going to try to do here is, I, clearly I put a huge number of issues on the table and I'd love to talk about any of them in the Q&A. But my final sort of uh, five minutes of the talk, what I want to sort of focus this on is how do we sort of draw, get people to trust the learning healthcare system more and to make their trust merited, okay? So we want to, I believe that, you know, as someone who works in a university setting where there's a lot of work done for medical research and to, to promote a learning healthcare system, I believe that we really want to be able to have people uh, uh, have confidence that if their records are entered in either an identified or de-identified way into the massive research that is part of a learning healthcare system, that they are able to know that they, that is trustworthy and also that the most sensitive information that they might care most about or might, might want to opt out of um, will be taken out for them. So one of the things that, you know, the, that is critical here is that you can have data segmentation for privacy such that parts of a medical record can be blacked out or cannot be shared for certain purposes, right? So you might say, and this gets to the question of how do you structure data collection such that individuals can feel confident that, say, I may want my entire health record shared with my psychiatrist, but I may not want my podiatrist to see the records from my psychiatrist, okay? That's like one example of that. And this is essentially a project that has gotten a lot of uh, push by uh, things like the, the Regenstreif Institute, by um, uh, HHS, by the Office of the National Coordinator of Health Information Technology. And they have focused particularly on these five categories of information as being types of information where you may want to give people the right to limit the dissemination of the information once it's in their health record, right? And these would be um, a domestic violence info, genetics, mental health, substance abuse, and reproductive or sexual health. Okay? And I just want, just to contextualize those, by the way, um, when Solov and another researcher, Dan Solov and another researcher, looked at different um, countries, they were looking at what data is considered sensitive in those countries' uh, privacy schemes. You know, this was done, I think, in many different countries around the world, and surveyed. And, you know, uh, the most sensitive information in general was health information. But we're talking about, just if you'll forgive going back one slide again, the most sensitive within the most sensitive, right? So this is yet another really interesting area for, uh, and just to, to keep track of the bidding, we're thinking about there's data, and then there's health data, and then there's sensitive health data. So there's a lot of complexity there just in those three types of levels at which we might want to have different rules and different granular consent options for individuals to decide where they want the data to be held, how far it can go, uh, et cetera. Um, there are some laws that already address this, clearly. There's HIPAA and the privacy rule has some, some language on all these areas. There's the out-of-pocket provision in high tech, which is essentially a provision that allows people to keep out of um, uh, records certain things that they pay out of pocket for. Um, and there's confidentiality of alcohol and drug abuse patient records. But we also need, I think, technical architectures to complement the legal requirements, right? Without the right technical architectures, the legal requirements can't be met. And so part of this is that, you know, with the Data Segmentation for Privacy Initiative, DS4P, this is widely conceptualized as adding privacy metadata to health information so that if it's disclosed, we know that certain parts of the record should not be disclosed or should be disclosed in a way that is particularly protected or secured. Um, one of the ways in which the Office of the National Coordinator for Health Information Technology has essentially pushed this initiative is that they have said that they want to enable implementation of disclosure policies that originate from the patient, the law, or an organization. Okay. So this is a really interesting tension. You know, how do you 
uh, eat the patient and the law and the organization may have very different goals, right? And when you think about, for example, sometimes the commandeering of health records for law enforcement purposes, they may be directly at odds, right? The patient's goal may be, I really don't want the cops to find out about former drug abuse. And the law enforcement goal may be, we need to be able to have access to this information. A very troubling tension there, right? It's a very troubling tension and it's something that comes up often in HIPAA law. Um, the other thing that they sort of argue for, and this is more on the research side, is they, they want these records to be able to operate in an interoperable manner within health information exchange. And they have to decide sort of a scope about how far each of these types of uh, enabling people to segment data for privacy will go. Well, one way in which you could sort of uh, devise the record is you could have something like this type of health record where you say, here's the patient name. I will disclose my name to this doctor. These are all anonymized names, et cetera. Um, medical information, I can either share all, you know, just automatically pick that, or I could say I'll share my medical information with the exception of specific information such as drug abuse sensitivity, psychiatric information, sexuality, alcohol abuse, et cetera. And then um, you could also ch choose the purposes for which it could be used. So this is one example of, say, enabling opt-in consent for certain research purposes or other, uh, other areas of health information use and sharing. Um, but I'm sure that the folks in this room have already thought about uh, and, and contemplate it. I'm sure there's many people that have you know, great insights in data structuring, in user experience, in user design, et cetera. And you've already thought about 100 ways to do this better. You know? <laughs> or maybe, maybe there are many, many ways to do this better. And that's something where I really hope that um, there will be much more attention paid in the future by the folks that are doing these electronic health record systems. Because sometimes it looks as though the market is moving towards, say, uh, in, in some ways, the market's fragmented, but in some ways, you know, there are certain giants in electronic health record provision that are really dominant, and getting them to pay attention to these types of issues is really hard, but I think the better designed they are um, and the easier they can be made uh, sort of modular, uh, the better. One final thing I just wanted to note is that sometimes physician worry, physicians worry when they say, wait a second, if I accept a partial record, Am I taking on the responsibility and the liability for misdiagnosing if, for example, I don't know something critical about this person? The response from the folks in the data segmentation for privacy community has been something like this in case of emergency break glass uh, condition where the doctor can sort of uh, press a button or somehow try, try to override uh, given certain rules. So that's one way in which you could sort of have res respond to that. I'm actually supervising a, pa a paper now by a uh, programmer who's becoming a lawyer who's working on clinical decision support software that would, that where someone would, who had the sensitive health information, they'd enable it, they'd allow it to go into clinical decision support software in the sort of black box of algorithmic uh, diagnostic support, et cetera, but it wouldn't necessarily go to the physician. So the physician could kind of be alerted by this algorithmic black box, oh wow, if you're giving, say, somebody a drug that makes their mouth dry, you might also want to know that they're taking another drug that wasn't disclosed to you, but that this black box knows also makes their mouth dry, so you may not want to exacerbate that, right? And that drug might be lithium or, you know, a, a, drug, a mental health, uh, sort of a, a drug for mental health, et cetera. So I think that is sort of one creative solution to that problem, but it's a really interesting problem, you know, where you have um, this tension between, say, the doctor wanting to know everything, which is just in microcosm the tension of, say, health information exchange and researchers wanting to know everything, versus the patient's sense that they really need the right to present themselves in the way they want to present themselves, to have that autonomy within the system. Um, so with that, I'd, I'd love your questions. Thanks so much. <laughs> yeah. um, are there any countries you know of that do already do something like this and do it well? I know that Estonia, for instance, has a sort of records permissioning system that I think includes allowing permissioning doctors to see healthcare data, but are there any other examples out there? You know, I have to admit, I, I know something about comparative health records and, and privacy laws, but I have not yet studied the, the, uh, its impact on this particular issue, this data segmentation issue. But I think you're, that is a great question to ask, you know, where are there the leaders in this area? Um, and I, I don't know, but I, I really appreciate that, and I will be looking into that when I, uh, and I'll try to maybe send information to the group uh, if I can find out. So, yeah. okay. and, and maybe a little follow-up to that, which is the, what you displayed as a kind of prototype for permissioning certain kinds of data um, 
you know, showing patients, showing, allowing doctors to see certain parts of your medical record and so forth. I feel like, the, I suppose the question I have is, is that just a more sophisticated system, a version of something that we already do with the same attendant problem? Namely, I go to a doctor, I sign a bunch of forms that say, okay, the doctor, you know, that authorize various things to that doctor, including my medical records and other things. But what I don't have from that is an overview of the, the consequences of my actions. So I don't have a way to look back at all of the things that I've signed, what relationships those are creating between different doctors, between doctors and insurers, between all the different parts of the healthcare system. And so that, again, is a user experience problem that goes beyond the simple permissioning in each case to how do I get a big picture of my, my health records? I, I want to try to show you a visualization of an attempt to do this, which is Latanya Sweeney's data map, which I think you know, is, is kind of shocking when you start looking at the, the evolution of what happened, say, in 1997 to your health records versus like what happened, what, where they go now. So if you look, for example, I mean, so this is an, a, an early version of it. And this reminds me a bit of the Mozilla software collusion, which I guess was an attempt to track the trackers who are tracking you online with ads. So she would sort of visualize like you, the patient, and here's information where it can go, say, to the physician or to the hospital, um, and then where they could in turn be sending it, you know, in different uh, scenarios. Or when you send it to the insurer, uh, which might send it to the pharm pharmacy benefits manager, which might send it to your pharmacy, et cetera. This is like a two-way um, arrow. So she has been trying really hard to document and to, in a user-friendly way, visualize the flow of health information over time. What's interesting, though, is that this is the map as of 1997. If you look at it now, um, uh, it, it is a much more complex scenario because there are so many other um, entities that are involved potentially in this area. And I think that that's where thinking about the overall effect of your disclosures could be really difficult because if you're um, waiting for, if you're trying to understand, you know, how is this going to affect um, uh, all of these different parties that could possibly get, be getting access as business associates to the hip recovered entities, that's really hard to, to figure out. And that's an area where I sometimes take a step back from these initiatives and I say, is the effort for notice and consent itself sort of futile, right? Because if you really are telling people, well, uh, if, if you've got sort of a, a model in mind, your mental model of the citizen as subject of data and as generator of data, if your mental model is that the, the, the sort of neoliberal model that the, to the winner go the spoils, to if you're, you're really shrewd with money, you might get rich, or you'll, you'll at least say, be able to be, do well. And if you're really shrewd with your data, you won't get you know, burned by, say, one of these entities uh, going after you because they, they found a vulnerability in your data. Um, but I worry that it's, just, it, it's such a complex landscape that it's very hard to really give people a fair sense of all the implications of data sharing from the get-go. Yeah. Because if you look at that map she's got, all of these things are not individual entities that fall into the class, but it's physicians, hospitals, it's even types of entities, and yeah. there's no breakdown in terms of yeah. the types of data elements. Yeah. So the, the entirety of the complexity of that is vastly understated by what you see there. Right, right, yeah, yeah that's true, yeah. So just to sort of add to, I think, Gideon's point, um, so, and, and a point that you raised, right, about, about user experience and how you make this actually meaningful without overwhelming people. So I'm, like, I've been going to lots of doctors lately, and, yeah. um, as, and I primarily go to a hospital that serves a lot of low-income patients. Um, and one thing that's, like, way over understaffed and it's over busy and everyone gets a sheaf of papers and, you know, often, like, the staff fills out the papers for you and says, like, you just sign it here, you know, doesn't tell you what you're doing. Um, you know, and everybody's been to the doctor and had this experience, right, where you're just presented with like a whole, like a clipboard full of stuff and you don't actually read it because you're not encouraged to, right? Like this is just a part of the processing. Right. Um, and so one thing I'm a little bit, I'm concerned about and I don't know how you solve this problem is like, so the hospital I go to, for example, like does have an electronic portal where I can go see my test results and I can see what medicines have been prescribed to me and I can, you know, see when my upcoming appointments are. And I use that information, right? And like it's presented essentially without context. It doesn't tell you what's normal. It doesn't tell you, you know, what's happening to those data. But like because I'm interested and I have the resources, like I can do the research and I can use that. Um, like very obviously, <clears throat> I'm not like the typical patient, right? So so one, I think 
one concern, right, is how you try and build a system through which, like, the people who are, like, we're not all Elaine's, right? Like, Elaine can do that, or, like, I can do that. Right. <laughs> um, but, like, you don't, want, you don't want the use of these data or the right to control these data to be something that only, like, neurotic, privileged people get the chance to control, right? Like, in that low-income people who may perhaps more likely have, you know, things that they actually do want to keep out of the public eye or out of law enforcement's hands, um, you know, don't have a meaningful opportunity to control. So I guess, I guess my question is just, like, how do you think about user experience when the range of patients is so disparate and when, you know, you don't want the protection to be sort of a function of people's socioeconomic privilege? Yeah, you know, it's something I was just, I'm you so just solve that problem. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so glad you mentioned that because I was actually just uh, um, alerted to this new decision by the uh, FINRA, which is the self-regulatory body for finance, that they were taking really seriously the risk of de-identification of investors. And that because of that, they were going to stop this given, <laughs> stop a, a program that I thought was kind of very helpful to certain forms of law enforcement. And so, you know, you, you do wonder about that uh, if it's sort of only something taken advantage of by a very small number of people, how is it useful? And I mean, yeah, it could be that this is a project that um, uh, is, I mean, in the worst case scenario, it becomes sort of a ritual of consent and a ritual that sort of gives people the form and the sense of control, but in fact hides the fact that these are systems that really are well beyond any individual's control, right? <laughs> because of, of, of all that's involved there. I guess that the, the answer then has to be that you start shifting from opportunities to control at the front end to um, uh, isolating and responding to very problematic outcomes on the back end, right? So you know you start you start auditing to make sure that employers are not you know getting un illicit access to the wellness program data. You start auditing to make sure that this isn't leaking out in ways that you know were unanticipated or that were could lead to troubling. Uh, and and uh, the final thing is that if you want to really and this is like a theme of chapter five of my book, I guess is that if you really want to free individuals to not have to worry so much about managing their data. Uh, in these very sensitive contexts, you have to essentially turn the panopticon that is now on them onto the users of the data who could be doing things illicitly, right? So you have to look at, uh, you know, look at what's all the information that that employer had before they fired the person? What was all the information that insurer had before they jacked up the rates by, by five times, et cetera? And make, when that's particularly troubling, illegal. And you may think that that may seem like a relatively utopian idea, but actually, that's something that came out of the Affordable Care Act relatively recently when you look at like the guaranteed issue provisions. Um, well, I used to give presentations like these, and I would point out uh, companies that would collect people's prescription data. And these companies, that one of the main, they, they said when they collected the prescription data that they would be used in emergency scenarios. Okay, so if someone comes into the emergency room in a foreign city and they didn't know what was wrong with them, like say they were unconscious, we'll look at the prescription data and they'll help us with them. Where they ended up, up really being repurposed in the mid-2000s was by insurance companies in the individual insurance market to deny insurance to people who had taken drugs like Prozac. Drugs like, you know, any depression was a red flag. Any sort of treatment for depression was a red flag. So we dealt with that. I think that was a manifestly terrible policy. I, I know. I know almost no one that defends a policy like that, right? So that got through in the Affordable Care Act. Um, but uh, query as to whether even that would be passed by uh, Congress today. Uh, but, but at least it does, it was at least a step to look at a particularly bad use and stop it, which I think is also part of the life insurance scenario, or, or GINA uh, scenario, so yeah. Yeah. So I'm going to take moderator uh, privilege and ask a question before I continue passing it on, because I want to extend um, Karen's point. Okay. Which is that, I actually have a huge problem with the obsession with control, and particularly okay. the pivot with regard to the individual as the actor of control. Okay. And the reason why is, is, is Karen highlights the issue of status as one major facet in the challenges of control, which is that you know someone may not have the status um, that that, allow, that affords them the privilege to be able to get access to it. Status to me is only one factor. I think about it in terms of four different factors. Status being one, um, uh, capacity being another. Capacity meaning that you know, the amount of time, energy, and knowledge it takes to decode anything that you've been given requires a whole different level of privilege. It's often very different than stats. They're very much connected with one another, as Karen points out. But I think of them as two discrete things. A third one is context, which is that 
a lot of what the meaning making of this this data is is not what you know in the Elaine example it's like oh you know she's difficult we know what the meaning making of that is but the meaning making of like putting down the codes of a particular drug combination is like uh, meaning making of that is very very difficult for somebody yeah. let alone the ways in which the data that you've been using in the past are going to be in the future because you have no mental map of what a future could look like in a way that a doctor or a health professional might. And that makes it very hard to even get your head around what that context will look like. And the fourth issue, which is one of the things I still haven't figured out how to get my head around, is the relationality of data. And we see it in the machine learning space in particular, which is that the value of the data is not actually about the individual, but it's about the individual in relationship to the other data sets. It's mm. certainly true for research, but more and more as we talk about predictive medicine and we talk about different analytics, we see this move towards um, the idea that information is only valuable in context to this, all this other information. Um, it's also, when we get to genetic, it's a different other aspect of relationality, which is that I may you know, choose to share or not share my genetic material, but that choice, suppose the choice, affects my family, regardless yes, of whatever yes. consent they may or may not have. Yeah. And so part of what I'm, I'm worried about is I feel like in an in American legal system in particular, that this idea of control, this idea of consent, is a red herring. It's, it's, it's like, it's, it, or maybe it's just sort of a pacifying you know, element where it makes you feel better, it makes you feel as though like, agency can be achieved by just creating these markers. And I'm worried that that's not actually solving any of the core problem. So I hear you on pivoting to see what's being done, but I think that even making that transparent won't deal with the complexity of this. And so this is where that I get lost. Uh, is that if I fail yeah. at, uh, if control is not going to work, if control and consent aren't going to get us there, if making visible or transparent is not really going to actually get us to all of this, then what? And that's where I'm like, as we're going to push you and say, help, where does that go? Where do we go beyond control? Are there any other legal <laughs> frameworks or cultural frameworks you can see getting us beyond that mechanism of individual control? I mean, I, I think that I'll answer very briefly and not do that justice because, I mean, there's it was such a rich question and I, and I want to continue the conversation on it. But I mean, I, I think very briefly, I think that you see a very similar move. Like I, I do some work in this digital labor space where we're thinking about the, what's the future of employment when everything's Uberized, right? I mean, home healthcare is just about to be Uberized, like everything's going to be Uber. And you know, where you essentially have a global reverse auction for labor where everyone's labor is sort of bid down to the lowest common denominator, et cetera, and then sort of there's some people you know, at the top who do very well out of that. Um, I, I sort of feel like that that's, that people make the pivot to a universal basic income as a response to that type of uh, glow world. And I think that you're seeing a very similar, you may see a similar sort of uh, uh, move in the data space where essentially people are, they, they, it's just about sort of safety nets for individuals and, and that there can never be too bad an outcome out of this. The one thing that I would say though that's really worrisome to me though is that if you make no effort to try to help people to keep their secrets within the healthcare system in a granular way, you may end up like driving people away from the healthcare system altogether, right? And the other thing that I think is, so I'll give two examples of this, and I mean, this shows just how, my own, how divided my own mind is about this. One would be, you know, in many uh, jurisdictions, to pass the bar, you have to, you, this was more common in the past, but I think it still happens in some states, you have to put on your bar application whether you've ever sought help, help for mental health issues. Um, and that's been challenged on disability grounds in many areas. But I believe that that in itself, no, people knowing that that data is going to get out there, um, it led a lot of people not to seek help, which I think is very troubling. On the other hand, though, my nightmare scenario with respect to this granular control uh, uh, stuff that I was putting out earlier is that imagine a world where only very few people choose this option with the exception. Merely choosing that option can then become a red flag on those people. <laughs> right? And so what you really have to ask when you, like before I would check this box, I would have to ask the doctor or ask the healthcare system, do people know I checked the box? Because you see exactly the same dynamic with Google's right to be forgotten. I think initially what they were doing with some, when they were trying to implement the right to be forgotten in Europe is they would put at the bottom of a page, by the way, 
this name has petitioned to have things forgotten about them. And then, and then people are like, ooh, my God. How? And then immediately the mind races to what's the worst thing they could have done, right? Um, and so now I think that's like a general proviso on name searches in Europe, although I'm not certain. You know, but I think that's, that's yet another really difficult question. When you, and it gets to your core issue of meaning making. And given systems with this level of complexity, the meaning making is really hard to keep track of. But I, I will continue to uh, think about that issue, those issues. Yeah, sorry. Uh, so I have lots of thoughts. Oh, yeah. um, I'm on a listserv with Adrian Gropper. Oh yeah. Right, the Society for Participatory Medicine, and they talk a lot about these issues. There's been a really tempestuous debate about this. Yeah. Particularly in the context of open notes, like you should be yeah. able to yeah. see everything, and. Um, <clears throat> the patients and providers and payers and all of the disparate people on this list server surfacing these um, events in which somebody was misdiagnosed as having diabetes. And this, this record sort of went all over that map and she was mistreated yeah. because of it. So if she or her parents had had the opportunity to look at it, maybe not everybody wants to do it, but if people do, that there should be a way for them to do it. And then there's also another strain that I'd like to ask you about. We're talking about um, people who are really interested in this topic as being people who are sort of representative of <clears throat> the standard bearers in the civil rights movement. Like, we have to take ownership of this. Maybe we're the people who are going to be out on the front lines making mistakes or making noise, but the <clears throat> the way the system is broken as far as um, owning your own data, having access to it, getting treated properly, because you can really actually get screwed up by these bad data things. So I'm interested in your thoughts about that. I do think that's a really critical issue. And I mean, I, a lot of my interest in this actually was, was driven not solely from an academic level, but as being sort of a primary caregiver for my mother for about a decade, because she was very, had many chronic illnesses and, and sort of trying to keep track of everything was almost like a, a part-time job for her, you know, in terms of like keeping all the medical records together and making sure that, you know, and, and trying to make sure that, because the doctors don't really coordinate. And there are incentives within the Affordable Care Act for there to be coordination. But, yeah, I, <laughs> I mean, there's a recent article in the New York Times called Who Coordinates the Coordinators? Which is that, you know, apparently these incentives have just led sometimes to another layer of bureaucracy and, 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 uh, and, and problematic. Uh, they're, they're, they're fighting, they're, they're hiding that data. The uh, recent ONC thing, uh, yes. they are refusing to share data. Yes. Oh, I'm so glad you brought that up. So there was also a recent report from March by the Office of the National Coordinator of Health Information Technology blaming either vendors or providers, mainly vendors, I guess, yeah, and of the EHRs for blocking data sharing, you know. So there are lots of problems where essentially data is being blocked not by, by, because of patient desire, but because of the commercial imperatives of the different players in the game, which is problematic too. So I do think that that's an area, and, and here's one glimmer of hope that I think might be helpful. I was talking to some folks that were from a pretty prominent learning healthcare system that had, um, made a misstep. They just decided to like barrel right into it and the community resisted, okay? And so then they sort of had to step back and they said, we're gonna have a community education program where we really try to present this to the community we serve as the new deal in healthcare, as, as in return for your, we're going to use your data in new ways, but we're gonna make you, we wanna make you aware of all the ways in which this data is going to be deployed for research and quality purposes and we sincerely are going to try to improve your health care via the use of that data. And I mean, that is a way in which, you know, you, you, uh, the, the question you raised about people needing to keep ownership and, control and, and uh, knowledge about their own medical records, maybe that is sort of a data literacy campaign that's like a media literacy campaign. You know, we, we are very familiar with the idea of media literacy and people need to be able to know who's funding the media, um, what are the media imperatives, why do certain voices rise to the top and why do, some don't. Maybe we need a very similar type of educational campaign with respect to how badly botched someone's healthcare record could be if they don't monitor it. So yeah. So the um, quick question is like, just like you just very quickly talked about Vioxx. 
yeah. as having the problem with Vioxx being discovered, not through clinical trials, but I just want to push back against that. I okay. researched that. Okay. The clinical trials did show that, but they misrepresented the data to the uh, FDA. Okay. Um, and I, okay. I've written about that. But um, in terms of the contradiction I want to pose, like on the one hand, I feel I'm going to echo Dana, like the sense of control that we have only for rich people, only for neurotic people, only for people who have the time and the energy and the knowledge is is a phantom, right? And partly it's a phantom because, uh, you know, there is nobody who's going to be able to say, this is what could happen with this data because we don't know what could happen with a given data. I'm a data scientist. I can't tell you what could be done with a given piece of data about you. Not only because I don't know all the models out there, but because technology gets better over time. So like right. the technology in 50 years for data mining is going to be able to do a lot more with this data. And maybe it's five years, not 50 years. So there's like, there's so many ways in which we don't have the control that we wish we had. and. So that's one side of things. And by the way, you know, wellness programs also open you up to gray regulatory, like Fitbit data. You're often in wellness programs asked to put Fitbit data out there. That might not be seen by your employer. That's what they talk about when they talk about privacy and, and wellness programs, but it is sold, mm, you know, mm, maybe right, not by Fitbit, right, but by right. other things that you have to give your data to. And that in, can be recycled and turn into a sort of a proxy medical file to, to be held against you. So my point is, even just your buying habits could be think, thought of as medical information. Like there is just no way you can think of having control over this stuff. On the other hand, and um, you know, and this is something I wish I had said last week at the at Daniel Buck Jones talk. Um, like what we it, it, in the business of data, in the business of data science, it's not whether you can do it; it's whether the costs of doing it are larger than um, the you know whether it's worth it. Right. as a business right. plan. Data brokers work because there are no rules about collecting the data. There's obviously some work they have to do to collect the data. They have to pay for some of it, they have to scrape some of it, et cetera. But then they get to sell it. So right. I just wanna like, so in other words, like you can't control data, but you can make it hard to collect, a pain in the ass to collect. You can make it difficult. And so that's why I, at the end of the day, I'm just like, yes, let's make more restrictions. Let's, let's, let's do this, even though it's pointless in a certain sense. Theoretically, it, it's still available using your, your shopping at Walmart, but if it makes it more difficult, then people will stop doing it because it won't be a, bus a viable business plan. Wow. See, I, I mean, I think that's a really, I mean, that, and by the way, the, the idea of just making the data collection more difficult, I mean, it, that does show up somewhat in times in the First Amendment, I mean, sorry, the Fourth Amendment literature on police, uh, and we just had a giant, fourth, I guess not a Fourth Amendment case, but a case on NSA bulk data collection today um, on this sort of, on exactly these types of issues, that if you, if you put in enough restrictions and requirements you really deter the police from, say, having dragnet surveillance of everybody, or having too much, you know, control over, or trying to understand, uh, uh, monitor people too much. And I think that's a really that sort of turns on its head the usual DC line that you know I get when I try to present papers like, you know, or a paper based in these areas, which is, oh, you're going to stifle innovation. And I think what you're sort of proposing, Kathy, is that really the enabling privacy even if in many ways it is a fearic battle for um, self-protection, at least slows the ultimate nightmare scenario, which is say, a large number of companies knowing everything about you, right? <laughs> because if you think about sort of the centripetal flow of data enabled by rapid data exchange, I mean, think about the nine major data brokers, right? Wouldn't it be very easy for them to just go to each other and say, hey, what's something that you don't have and there's something that I have that you don't have, can we just trade that for nothing? You know, I mean, it's really, but the problem is, you know, you, you ask uh, the FTC and others to actually find out what the, what the practices of data exchange among them are, and that they consider one of their most tightly held trade secrets. And I think that one of the critical areas too is that just to get a handle on the nature of the problem, we need to make one basic demand on regulators and the industry, which is where's your data coming from and where is it going to? Right? Because otherwise, you're never going to be able to uh, correct the errors that you brought up. You're never going to be able to sort of find out if someone's making illicit judgments, you know, on the basis of very troubling data, where that came from, uh, or where it was being used, etc. So I think that is a really good uh, a way of promoting, I think, regulation and granularity 
in ways that, that help people. But I will push back in one way, though, which is that and I'm sure Daniel will uh, appreciate this, which is one of the ironies I find is that in the, it's the asymmetry of the regulatory profile such that the health sector is so highly regulated and I think has a much higher on balance share of things being done to help people, to cure disease, et cetera, as opposed to, say, the Wild West of the data brokers who may have lots of information about people's health conditions. So I think what we really have to also do is to train policymakers in, in DC to realize that it's like it's not just HIPAA-covered entities and their business associates and their subcontractors that are at the core of the health data problem. Right now, they're, being, they're in a highly regulated space, but there's so many other threats to knowing about people's health information, health profile, that they've really got to get on. Uh, and I would, I would prioritize that as a regulatory matter. Okay, great. <laughs> great. So uh, one of the issues you raised about consent um, that epidemiologists and researchers are very concerned about is consent bias. That yeah. Different people will consent than those who uh, won't consent, and that can really distort statistically our impression of multivariate relationships yeah. between demographics and between different uh, things that are being, uh, if we have granule, uh, granular control, uh, things that are being left out. One of the things that the health industry doesn't do, and certainly the data brokers don't do at all, is sampling. And there's almost nothing that you can't find out that is true in general that can uh, not be learned by a 50% sample. So were we to enforce across the board, and here, you know, whether there would ever be political will big enough to beat the data brokers into submission on this, but were we to enforce across the board that you could only get 50% of the people in the group that you're reporting on, it would really destroy the ability for re-identification and it would provide a mask for those people who want to individually opt out of things. And in order to hmm. adjust for consent okay. by biases, we want to be able to say, okay, um, certain groups are opting out of information on this particular thing, we need to know that. It, for example, would, would have been a great shame if Haitians uh, had not been appreciated to be important in the AIDS epidemic in the early start. Privacy concerns there, certainly. But at the same time, you can't stop an epidemic unless you know, you know what's going on and with whom. Right. So it, it, the idea that people uh, should be allowed to opt out, um, even in de-identified data, is something that I think deserves merit and consideration but even more importantly, buttressing that with some systematic rules about what, what we report, because you almost never need the entire group to learn what's true in general. Uh, you can get by uh, very well on a partial sample, and um, I think that's one potential solution. Uh, thoughts? I, I really appreciate that, Daniel, and, and I, I, I want to say I mean, you, you've really helped educate me on many aspects of this area, and um, I think that the, uh, that is a very important insight. And I would also just to even make the uh, issue more viscerally um, uh, real to folks is, you know, you worry about certain situations where you could have a cycle of disadvantage and distrust, where essentially, let's say you have a population that uh, en masse, that population decides to opt out, but in fact could be very much helped by the research enabled by the, the data that they would have contributed had they not distrusted the system overall. I will say though that the one thing that I need to really study, and I think this is an area that like I think data science and statistics sort of come together in the whole question of consent bias. And there's a guy named Mark Rothstein who is a you know, law professor who sort of challenged the idea of consent bias. Um, Barbara Evans has you know, responded to him and they've gone at it in the law review literature. But I, and I, I do totally trust the, the statisticians here, but I've heard also there is some controversy within the data science field itself about you know, some of the N equals all claims and some of the other questions about you know, the, the degree to which having a large enough sample renders uh, other statistical concerns less and less valid. So we're, we're gonna have to think more and more about those lines, but I, I completely am on board with the idea that if small groups of, of folks that are particularly impacted by particular diseases are opting their way out, that is a real problem for the health care system to consider. Yeah. Sort of a related question. I was wondering if the issue of consent ever comes up as being able to 
consent that a diagnosis was appropriate for you since medicine can be subjective and the patient can have their own context and experience to add. Um, does, like, does the model of the doctor being the decider of what the data is ever shift with so much data going back and forth? Are there any new opportunities for a patient to provide additional context or rebuttal to a diagnosis? That is such a great question. And I think that that is an area where I do know within HIPAA itself, there are rights of correction, rights of inspection, annotation. Um, and I, I, but deletion, I've got to look up because I've got to compare the HIPAA regime with like the FICRA regime, the Fair Credit Reporting Act, and you know how the, the, the sort of conflicts over uh, one's presentation in the record are handled. It is, I think that you know where I see a lot of the energy going in that area is toward the peer-to-peer, patient-based social networks like patients like me, where I think particularly it feels empowering to the patient to be in a setting where they can talk about their condition with other co-sufferers without the time constraints of like the doctor saying, let's get this over in 10 minutes, or you know, having to like distill it into uh, 10 words. And I think there's gonna be increasing demand for this because there's so much controversy now in electronic health records over copying and pasting. So there's a lot of doctors now who are you know, pressed for time and they're just you know, copying and pasting certain snippets about people that are really not doing justice to the individual conditions. So where is the technology you would think would be enabling a richer, more complex portrait of the individuals involved? It's not. Now, if I were to think 5, 10, 15 years out in advance, I think the far future of this type of data collection for people that want to opt in, if it's not seen as too spooky, is just real-time video, audio, et cetera, you know, taking in the information from people, right? I mean, I, I use the example in my article, The Grand Bargains for Big Data, about cough, you know, writing down heavy cough, light cough, um, funny cough, you know, whatever a cough might be. But if you can actually have a sort of machine that's like videotaping the patient, and it is, you know, that's the cough, right? That, in a way, is, the, is the, 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 our most sophisticated way of measuring or of identifying it. That, I think, is a really interesting question in pattern recognition and how far people will go for that. I once talked, by the way, by, to some Canadian scholars who talked about sort of videotaping the whole hospital just for liability concerns. Uh, now, I, I don't think that should be done for liability concerns, but if there's a, a real use case for improving healthcare and pattern recognition of diagnoses on the basis of that type of really rich data, can data uh, intake, that might be a really interesting possibility. Yeah. Um, just in commenting on that, you can collect data, like I do that at Cornell Tech, so we look at people's um, small data in real time, collecting it from the phone, they put in their self-report, and we wind up with this very interesting data set of an individual patient predicting their flare-ups, let's say in an autoimmune disease. And then you take that to the physician who actually doesn't really want to see it because there's not an easy way to start processing lots of information for patients. So I think like one of the main problems is we can collect a lot of data on people that can provide good information, but then how is that used to improve health? So I think about that. And then also just in real time, um, like in participatory medicine, when people get sick in the hospital, you could be on a patient floor and you can't even get your own data and find out the medications given to you that day, nor can you leave the hospital easily with your information. And I think the idea of like opting in and opting out, it's all interesting, but from a clinical point of view, having worked with addicts and patients like that, you really, it's, they, they normally opt out. Like a lot of patients will opt out. They won't share with every provider that they're drinking or using Coke, and I think that does become a problem. So I think a lot of this is like an intellectual argument that if it translated into everyday practice, could actually actually hurt people. There is a stigma around mental health, and I think we just saw that with the pilot who yes. had yes. notes and maybe didn't show it and whatever went on there. But, you know, it is a very fine area, but I think it's just like if we look at the hospitals and everybody's on Epic, which is privately held, yeah. I guess, you know, it doesn't seem like we're solving the problem where the patient's actually being treated in a way that makes sense clinically. I don't know what you're no, so I mean, there's, there's so many like very important points there, and I, I guess the one that just really sticks in my mind is the um, uh, massive resistance of some systems to accurately reporting out and getting people like the full range of data that they ought to be just sort of expect as a matter of right. 
hopefully the stuff I was talking about with meaningful use is going to lead to some level of accountability there whereby they could be either lose their subsidies that they got under the High Tech Act or be docked one to two percent of their overall um, uh, uh, Medicare spend. But I think that those penalties were actually removed recently. I'm not certain. It's hard. This is such a fast-moving area of law that it's like very hard to keep on track of every <laughs> of, of every every single part of it. But I think that that's. Uh, I take your broader point, which is that before developing these sort of castles in the sky of infinitely granular consent to varying levels of sensitive health information within a very complex health record among diverse providers interfacing with massive systems of health information exchange and observational research. Before we do all that, maybe we should just, you know, start on the ground level and say, are people getting their records out? <laughs> you know, as it stands, are, are people even able to get access to the records? I, I totally agree with that. It reminds me of, you know, the whole Ms. Dickens, uh, Mrs. Jellyby problem, where Mrs. Jellyby was always trying to save the children in, in Africa and, like, wasn't looking right in front of her, her face of, like, the problems in her neighborhood. And that's, that is a huge problem. I mean, I am very discouraged sometimes, too, by the industry response so often to these IT issues is one of technical impossibility. You know, like for example, there was a part of the High Tech Act that said patients have a right not merely to their medical records, but to know who accessed their medical records, okay? There has been just huge resistance to implementation of that among the vendors, among the providers, among others, you know, and, and I think that's, it's, it's tough, it's tough, and, and you know, the, the enforcement resources are not there, the, um, uh, and sometimes there's an innovative state attorney general that goes after things, but it's pretty rare, so, yeah. I wouldn't understand even how that's done. Like all the hospitals share, all the hospitals now are merging in the city, for example, so they're all on the same system. So I wouldn't even know to ask the question if five people at NYU and 10 people at Mount Sinai, maybe friends of mine decided to access my records. I wouldn't, like there's not even a, a prompt for the patient to know, you know what, I see yeah. that everybody's interested in me. You know, like it, you just wouldn't even know. There's not, it's not even built in appropriately. So that's yeah. like a privacy issue as well. Yeah, and that, that really suggests that in the future of these, to the extent that any future activists want to build in privacy rights to statutes like high tech, they need to make sure that they are actually also requiring people to be informed of the rights. However, the only, the, the worry I have about that is that there's such a pressure, the time pressure, where's the reimbursement, right? And so they've got to also not only build in the right, notice of the right, reimbursement for informing people of the right. And that's really hard to build in. Yeah. Oh, I mean, I guess a lot of my questions have actually been um, asked. One th comment I wanted to make was especially with, with regards to consent um, in terms of the limitations that uh, you might have in different contexts. So whether or not a drug, uh, somebody's coming in and they're currently high on drugs or how that might affect this consent process. But I also wanted to get your thoughts on um, the overwhelming resistance to the care.data program in the UK mm. um, that kind of signified that the fears about this type of program, this um, digitization of health records, um, kind of outweighed um, the desire for individuals to access their own individual health records. So I kind of wanted to hear. And could you, was this, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not totally up to, I know it's the British election today and I should be, yeah. but, I, but I, I'm not totally up to date on that scandal. Was this the one where NHS was selling the records to insurers or is this another No, thing? they weren't. Is so um, NHS had um, basically a plan to um, take individual health records, provide a back end, um, system so that individuals could um, gain access to their own data and be able to check it for accuracy. And there was just such overwhelming resistance that the program has been pushed back and pushed back and pushed back. And resistance by the by, by patients or by, oh, by, by patients. politicians? Yeah, by, by, yeah. And what was the rationale for that? There's privacy. So it's a generalized privacy concern. I'm not really sure. Um, I mean, I guess I understand it. No, I, I'm so glad you asked about that because my big concern is that to the extent that you make this, the, that you achieve data liquidity, and I was just actually, the, one of the, the readings I sort of suggested for today, the one from 2010, has that stated as a goal, achieving data liquidity. So the, the faster and faster interoperability and transmission of the data about oneself. And I guess I do understand where people might say, you know, if my health records are really hard to get, 
And by the way, at the end of that Seinfeld clip, um, it's this sort of hilarious situation where they're trying to get the data, and they get the information, and they can't. And if they're really hard to get, it's hard for anyone to demand of me that I get it for them. Whereas I guess people might be thinking if it's just instantaneously available via a blue button or just instantaneously available on a computer screen, then it's much easier for others to demand a look at it. I, I guess that's a concern, but I'm gonna have to research the, the nature of that resistance because it is so foreign to you know, my admittedly parochial US consent-based consumer empowerment mindset. So yeah. Um, just to you touched on something in an answer a few minutes ago where you talked about people's ability to correct uh, records that were date, days about them that was wrong. And so that raised me the question of how, how does one track through the system how a piece of data or how a piece of information about a patient was generated? Is there any sort of, can you imagine a way of sort of data provenance basically? Yes, I mean, that to me is, is really the, such a critical question in terms of tracking data, and this is something that has animated my sort of research and uh, uh, the book that I, uh, the black box book, in so many ways. Um, one in which, you know, the, the, these fusion centers that are set up by the Department of Homeland Security and local police forces have a huge problem with this, where someone can have derogatory information influ entered in, onto them by one police station in one city, and then thanks to the Fusion Center Network, that is automatically populated into databases across all 70 Fusion Centers across the United States. And amazingly enough, they did not devise a system that would automatically revert it back or get rid of it once it was deleted in the home source. <laughs> you know, and that to me is like maybe a basic principle of future data infrastructures, network infrastructures, others would be that type of phoning home or that type of idea, but, yeah, sorry. There's a reason why it's not called a fission center. Okay. It's a fusion center. Yes, <laughs> yes, well, go ahead. Together. It doesn't take them apart. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. Well, I mean, but it, but it should at least be, I mean, I would think though that as a, uh, looking at the, the the organic statute or regulations related to these things, there are, under like the fair information practices or other sorts of principles, some basic obligation of accuracy, you know, and I would think that that would be, I mean, the other thing that's really interesting here is that, you know, my, now admittedly, there might be folks in the room, there probably are, I, I know there are many folks in the room much more technically sophisticated than me, but, you know, I know that like my device is going to report back on me if I download certain types of content and, you know, that's not, the, not that goes against the digital rights system of Apple or some other entity, et cetera. And it seems in so many intellectual property contexts, we are the, the, the either device manufacturers or the owners of the content or others are able to insist upon, because they have the power, this type of phoning home. And this, this phoning home capability was, uh, I, I, Randy Picker has a good article from 2008 about you know, predicting that as being the future of so many devices that you know, to maintain either software updates or to maintain the integrity of the data in them, they would phone home to a central source. And I just sort of feel like this, this project of data provenance is a really important one. And this gets back to Kathy's point, which is, okay, so maybe that's going to be something that is going to slow down the spread of data right now. But I think that in the long run, it really is essential to ensuring the integrity and accuracy of these systems. You know, what be they for health research, be they for you know lots of other areas. But I know also the big pressure in among a lot of big data evangelists is to say, our whole advantage is that there's this volume, veracity, and vo volume, velocity, and variety. Don't care too much about veracity of any particular bit of it, because you know the, the having so much will overwhelm. The signal in the in the huge amount of data will overwhelm any particular aspect of noise, but you know when when the data is important enough, yes, I think this provenance project is a really really important one, and I I discuss a little bit in chapter five in the book about what it might look like from a regulatory perspective. Yeah, and I, I know that there's still more questions, but we are out of time. I'm hoping Frank will be willing to stick around for oh, a few yeah. minutes and talk to folks. Um, I want to say thank you again for all oh, of us. You're welcome. Thanks. <laughs> thank you.